Hello, I'm Matt Kelly. And I'm Matt Dancona. And this is the two mats for the week ending Friday, the 22nd of September. Two journalists who have, at times, held destiny in their hands. Aha. Well, I mean, to start with, <laughs> yes. we talked about Rupert Murdoch and you revealed, and I don't want to spoil it, an amazing anecdote story about how you how are I basically are personally yeah. responsible for his longevity. Well, I people should listen, but I saved Rupert Murdoch's life. You need to listen. I don't know whether that's a boast or something to be ashamed you, you, of. But, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's essential listening. I, or at least I saved him from a broken nose. I think at minimum. What else did we talk about, Matt? Then we talked about um, the allegations against Russell Brand and yeah. what they meant and also the, the, the era from which they hail and yeah. what, if anything, has changed. Yeah. And we talked a little bit at the end about Michael Caine's new movie and about Keir Starmer's wrestling with the EU. Yes. And both had things to we, say we about We have a that. slightly different take on it. But we so. do, but it's, it, um, that's, that is a feature of, of what he thinks, isn't <laughs> it's it? It's only a feature of Brexit. It, it's <laughs> a feature of Brexit, yeah. Exactly. So what are we going to call this week's uh, episode? Rupert and Russell? Saving Rupert Murdoch. or I saved Murdoch's life. You Obviously. Didn't. I did. I yeah, saved Murdoch's life. Fair enough, fair enough. We're going to call be that. it. Okay, so this is The Two Mats, episode 14. I saved Rupert Murdoch's life. Enjoy. Enjoy. So, Matt, breaking news. Massive breaking news. Um, we're recording this on Thursday. That's, we need to give the time to make this absolutely on point at about three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, and within the last half hour, the news mm. has broken that uh, Rupert Murdoch is stepping down Yeah, uh, from his position at the pinnacle of the media empire that has been at the heart of politics and media for decades and handing over to his son, Lachlan. Yeah. Um, so... The succession storyline has been resolved not in four seasons, but in a yeah. space of one press release. And it's, um, I think, f- for both of us, having been in journalism, you know, for the period we we had respectively, it's and indeed for anyone who's interested in media and politics and power, it's a hell of a moment, isn't it's, it? I mean, it's literally all our lives. Yes, he has been our chosen profession is journalism centred around newspaper journalism. Yes. So all our lives, he has literally been the dominant figure in that industry. Yeah, I mean, uh, my first job in journalism, um, I'd done a brief stint at Index on Censorship as a, as a researcher, but my first sort of full-time job was um, at the time, from 1991, as a graduate trainee. And I'd, I have to say, I had a wonderful time at the Times, five years. And, I, you know, I'd go, it was still in Wapping, the whole of the yeah. the news operation was there. And it was a massive plant. And you'd go, and the journalists would file in in the morning. And then at night, uh, big trucks would come down a ramp full of copies of The Sun and The Times. Yeah. Uh, or at the weekends, The News of the World, RIP. And um, well, The no, Sunday. Uh, not well, rep. RIP with R-I- a stake in its heart. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in, indeed, indeed. I mean, uh, RIP in the sort of polite yeah. sense of yeah. the word. Uh, courteous um and the sunday times and um that was i mean it felt like and it was the beating heart of something yeah and you know the extent to which particularly before this was pre the web really you know um and pre long pre social media there were only a few what seven national news titles so the extent to which i mean i did a lot of editorial writing at the times and and it was the case. You should that, explain what that means. Uh, the the uh, uh, the editorial in the newspaper and st- still exists is the unsigned view of the newspaper, and there's usually a bunch of people who write this on the basis of what the editor of the day has decided is the right policy for the paper. And at the time, and this was a sort of bracing introduction to the world of politics. If you were writing leaders, they were called leading articles. For the times you would be put straight through to the relevant cabinet minister yeah on background who would be wanting to sell the policy of the day um now i don't know if that's still true anymore but it's just a way of exp- of giving a sense of how you know the sun was obviously much much bigger in terms of circulation and it was massive in 
Tony Blair's campaign to become prime minister um, in 1997 because the Sun backed him. But um, the Times was kind of at the heart of, if you like, policy making and intellectual, uh, the intellectual side of politics. And, you know, Murdoch would come and, and have little lunches and was unfailingly courteous. And I think we've discussed this on the podcast before. You know, whatever else one says about his impact upon British culture and politics, and there's a lot to say, mm. he loved newspapers. He did, yeah. He had yeah. and has ink in his yeah. blood. Yeah. He, he, really do, he really does. He really does. He does. And, and the, you know, it's worth probably recapping for those who aren't newspaper obsessives, the, how, how it all began, yes. really. And he, he bought a moribund tabloid newspaper called the sun from i think the thompsons yeah it, they owned it at the time it was the it 70s, had been yeah. it had been started by the mirror group um and had sort of bounced along and not done very much and the mirror in the 1950s was the absolute dominant working class newspaper in the world you know and the mirror actually invented that kind of journalism yeah. very picture based speaking in the working class vernacular anti-establishment yeah. you know so not you know that when they blew up royal family secrets and stuff like this it's it's hard now to describe it was kind massively of sense powerful. of shock massively powerful. And, and a campaigning paper as well you know it was a, a real great newspaper uh, largely conceived by a genius called hugh cudlip who was uh, a genius. is memorialized in the hugh cudlip award every year at the yeah. society of editors award and then murdoch comes along and picks up this Look alike, the sun, which is uh, a nothing, uh, very mod, very modest circulation in comparison to the the mirror, which was selling, I think, about five million copies at the time. There was one issue of the Daily Mirror sold seven million copies in a single day. It was the uh, it was the Queen's coronation issue, Incredible. and that I think today that is still it's a world record, and it'll of course never be beaten for a, an English language newspaper. Murdoch comes along, buys the sun. And utterly copies the Daily Mirror secret, but with steroids on steroids, and and a right wing and a and a right wing agenda. And then later, ten fifteen years later, having gone through the editorship of a guy called Larry Lamb, a certain Kelvin McKenzie arrives, and Kelvin McKenzie slots into Murdoch's vision of what the Sun should be perfectly. absolutely perfectly. Yeah. He's aggressive. He's populist. He's right wing. He's very sexist, but he has got the ability, like him or loathe him, he has got the ability to catch a story and project it to and the a nation headline. with such gusto yeah. that it becomes compelling. And this is the secret of the Soar Away Sun. Yeah. And that was their catchphrase, the Soar Away Sun. And it went on to dominate media for 25, 30 years, it probably. Did. It did. Ter- I mean, know, it was, it was, this is why when Blair won over the sun um i mean now it's it's hard to explain how big a moment that was yeah. in the the end of that conservative era yeah that's you know, right. because the sun had been so supportive of thatcher and then yeah. initially supportive of major but not after um made sort of the, the disaster of black wednesday and his yeah. decline and but for for the sun with all of what you've just described matt to yeah. back the Labour Party was yeah. a huge cultural and political moment. Ha, yeah, I mean, ha, as you say, that very famous Kinnock front page where they had Kinnock in a, well, a the light last bulb person saying, the last, please switch off the lights, lights if Kinnock wins. And Kinnock was furious yeah. with um, with our colleague Alistair Campbell and yes. as he relates in his diaries and with Blair himself for cozying up to yeah. Murdoch, though... In, in terms of getting Labour back into office, they were, right. they were dead right. So they so so again, when we think about Murdoch's influence on culture, and I, I would hate listeners to think that any of this is hagiographic because it's not. But there's there's no way to get around from the fact that Murdoch has been a defining cultural influence. It's just on this historical. It's, it's it's for it's, two generations. It's empirical. You know. you know. There's so so Murdoch invites Blair to their big. Conferencing, yeah, I was there, and you you were there. I was there. How? I mean, what was it like? Well, it was extraordinary because um, there are two aspects to it which are extraordinary. First of all, it was amazing to have this the whole group of um, the Murdoch bits of the empire there, and it was they were just about to launch Fox News, like the meeting of the five families. That it was very much like in in in, on a sunny uh, (laughs) island off the coast of Australia, Um, and then to see. Blair, Alastair Campbell, Angie Hunter, you know, all wearing 
suits, I remember, because they were very uh, rightly nervous that someone from the mirror would be there in the trees taking photographs and they didn't want to be seen in News Corp leisure wear, which we were all hilariously wearing. Mm. So there was, I mean, just as an experience, it was amazing. And, and I remember one of the workshops, one of the Americans uh, said, wouldn't it be better if the Times, which I worked for at the time, was called the Murdoch Times? And I had to explain that this would be, uh, you know, a very, very <laughs> imaginative idea, probably suboptimal, right? <laughs> um, but the other thing that was striking, and it shows how, you know, th th there is an element of succession in all this, is that Lachlan, who was then quite young, um, was being introduced at one of the dinners to every single table. And it was absolutely clearly a laying on of hands. Right. But as we know, the story was not linear because Lachlan went out, fell out of favour. The other son, James, came into the picture. Elizabeth, the daughter, sort of was named for a while. And this is where Jesse Armstrong got the idea for uh, Waystar Royco and, and uh, Logan Roy and Succession and so on. But actually, it's all come back to Lachlan. Yeah, it's amazing. End. It so, is an amazing so story. So I, I, um, I've got a little Lachlan anecdote, personal story. I was doing a <laughs> subbing shift on The Times. Um, in a, this must have been in about 1995. And sat next to me, what, no, 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 1992 or so. That's I what was there. Thought. Sat next to me was Lachlan Murdoch doing a subbing shift oh, as, a, really? as a, and his That's dad a... had put him in to spend a week on the sun, a couple of days on the yeah. times, spend time with the commercial department, go out with the distribution guys, spend time with a news agent to, again, steep him in the newspaper culture. And I, I do remember, obviously, I was on a tryout for a job. Lachlan was sitting there. He had a, a huge, big, thick textbook of the works of Immanuel Kant on his on his book. When we went off for a pint from Wapping, he said, uh, "No, I'm just going to stay behind. I'm on chapter 16. I've got to I've got to get through it by the end yeah. of the, the week." And but I do remember it was the time when um, Buckingham Palace had just been open to tourists, and there was a headline that um, Lachlan had been working on. And he had spelt the word Q. It was a terrible headline he'd written, but I was looking over his shoulder and he'd spelt the word Q, C-U-E, right? And Fabulous. the chief sub-editor wandered over and looked over his shoulder and I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, I can't wait this. For is this is going to be a moment. And he tapped him on the back and he said, great headline, son, great headline. And walked yeah, there's, off. There's, <laughs> there's nothing like professional courage, is so there? I don't know whether Lachlan yet knows how to spell the word Q, but anyway, he's washed up okay, as it turns out. We mean out. that fun out. And I suppose, um, should we scroll forward to hacking and yes, all that? Yes, definitely. Um, because... Well, I mean, I, I, on a personal basis, I would like to... Uh, also mention Hillsborough as well. Oh, good point. Yes. Which, which I think was a uh, the big, the first of of a number of massive catastrophic missteps by News UK, but one that never really was taken responsibility for within the Murdoch Empire. And I, I've always wondered um, had Murdoch responded to Kelvin McKenzie's atrocious reporting around the Hillsborough disaster, if he'd have responded to it in the same way that he did around the Millie Dowler phone hacking, how different things might have turned out. Because you might have had a, a period of a chastened Sun newspaper, you know, had that, you know, if the Sun had, had done the Hillsborough disaster and had been held accountable for it at the time, he'd have closed that down, I presumably. Think, but I think to your point, Mike, it's, it's, it's all about power, isn't it? Yeah. At the time of Hillsborough yeah. uh, and reporting on that, the Sun couldn't give a toss it That's felt, right. felt complete impunity by the time Millie Dowler came round it was um it, it was, was a very different story because yeah. there was it was now competing in the era of social media and and everything online and so on yeah so I suppose to recap hacking um what happened in a nutshell was that it became clear that uh and I was hacked uh, you know myself um, Were you? yeah not to any ex extent I yeah. mean it, I was editing The Spectator and given my predecessor, predecessor Mr. Boris Johnson, oh. I think the ex officio, the editor of The Spectator, was um, hacked or just on a sort of industrial level, yeah. you know. Um, there were only three calls, but I did have to go into Putney Cop Shop and give a statement. I wow. mean, there was nothing. Did you get any money from it? No, I mean, you know, there was nothing. It, it didn't amount to a, a row of beans. Right. Um, but it was a, you know, a massive, massive consequential story. And it uh, the, the the thing that kind of I think tipped the balance was the fact that um, 
the news of the world was revealed to have hacked the phone of Millie Dowler, who yeah. was a very young girl killed. And um, this then led to the Leveson inquiry. And I, I don't know if um, our producer, Matt Hill, has got a clip of um, Murdoch and James um, Murdoch appearing before... It's not Leveson, oh, is it's it? It's not Leveson. It's, it's, the, it's one of the committees, it's, it's select, one of the committee, committee, the select committees. The select committee. Yeah. And it's an extraordinary moment. It's an incredible and, moment. And one that made us all gasp, I think. You, have you got it, Matt? As for my comments, Mr. Chairman, and my statement, which I believe was around the closure uh, of the News of the World newspaper. Before you get to that, I would just like to say one sentence. Right. This is the most humble day of my life. I mean, <laughs> it's... Even now, it's astonishing. It's amazing. It was an amazing yeah. moment. Watching a person who had, we'd all seen bestride the world, having to admit that there were limits to his power. I think it was the first time that had ever happened, certainly publicly. I think it was the first time it had ever occurred to him as well. Yes. You know, that it seemed to me to be a guy who was just suddenly caught in a reality moment, a yes. massive reality check. Yes. And and that's what he was. I don't think I don't think he was referring to humility around the harm he'd caused no. Millie Dowler's family, or the kind of betrayal in journalistic ethics or any of that. I think he was referring to the humility he himself suddenly felt at this sudden whipping away of the carpet from underneath his feet. I mean, it was like busted, wasn't it? Yeah, he, I'm busted, and yeah. and he wasn't used to that. Yeah. Um, because to use your mafia analogy, you know, he, he thought he, metaphorically with the political class, bought protection from the cops. And here he was suddenly in front of MPs having to yeah. answer for stuff. And it was a very disagreeable experience for him. Yeah. Um, so I remember at the time, a lot of speculation about, well, now he's humbled, will the Murdoch Empire change? <laughs> Not so fast. Because fast forward, I suppose, to the 2020 election, and uh, in America, the presidential election and Trump, ele Trump's election denial and Fox News joins in this narrative. But with the problem that its own prediction electoral forecast team the night of the election had accurately uh, predicted that Biden was winning. And so suddenly they had they faced this problem, which was they're reporting accurately, but their l viewers are turning over to more MAGA-ish, more Trumpite uh, channels like Newsmax. And so they then followed this extraordinary um, kind of spectacle, which became public uh, due to a, a, a law case earlier this year, when um, everyone at Fox knew that Trump's claim that the election had been stolen was nonsense. And yet the key presenters and the programmes were giving airtime to Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, people who are now named in many of the Trump indictments, spouting nonsense, um, no, but the, you know, knowingly so. And uh, they were sued by Dominion, one of the um, electoral software companies involved in, in this um, early this year, and it was settled out of court for many hundreds of well, millions. Well, first, something like three quarters of a billion. Seven hundred and eighty-seven point yeah. five million dollars right. yeah. in April, and it was reported that Murdoch thought he'd get away with fifty million, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it and it cost him three quarters. Well, of a I mean, I think you know Dominion had lost business on the back of it. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about that is that, um, and I remember writing about it at the time um, before the settlement was that Lachlan was as deeply involved in the deception as his father, Rupert, if not more so. You know, he was running Fox and he was one of the guys saying, we need to watch out, you know, we're losing viewers. What do we do to, in terms of our coverage of this story to win them back? So actually the, the humility, as you said earlier, yeah. is, is entirely on the surface. I mean, yeah. they, 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 Paid, they paid off Dominion, yeah. and in spite of everything that was revealed about Lachlan, he is now inheriting the empire. And so, I mean, I wonder what kind of um, one, what kind of em emperor will he, will Lachlan turn out to be? Because it's a very different empire than the one it was. Yes, you know, in its pomp, much reduced, much reduced, and, and, and also Lachlan, by all accounts, I think doesn't 
care that much about newspapers. Certainly no. isn't a, a newspaper native like you know like his dad. No, it's very interesting because um, I, le- I learned um, earlier this week that his father, Rupert, has put in a bid for the whole Telegraph Group. Now it's it's been widely reported that they want the Spectator, which they'd like to turn into a global magazine. And I think there have been talks between the Spectator and the Murdoch Empire. But there'll be a tension here because, as you say, Lachlan, I think, regards most print as ridiculously analogue and old-fashioned and 20th century. He might want to keep the Wall Street Journal or the New York Post, who knows, but I'd be surprised if his instinct is to keep the British titles. And yet, here is his father, age 92, bidding for another financially troubled newspaper group is it is it at all feasible that rupert would run the telegraph the sunday telegraph and the spectator well, here, as a kind of i think we're at the bone here which hobby. is like what does emeritus mean yes. right i mean there's a famous story about um because well again he's now going to be chairman of emeritus, yes is it? Yeah, yeah there's a famous story about murdoch sacking one of his editors i can't remember who it was and this guy taking the title editor emeritus and the the sacked editor asking what that meant, yeah. and Murdoch replied, "Well, the E stands for exit, and, <laughs> and the meritus is because you bloody deserve it, right?" <laughs> so, but I don't think he'll be that kind of emeritus. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine him not, to some extent, after all these decades, mm. being a backseat driver. Well, he also owns a big chunk of yes, that, yes, that. and and so will he be? I mean, again. The succession is he on the board. I mean, do we? Do we uh, that we don't know yet. Yeah. But I mean, I I can't imagine he's stepping back entirely. No. And again, we get into succession territory because the one thing you can be sure of of the kind of mindset and mentality of these kind of media moguls is that they believe they're immortal, yeah. and they certainly don't hand over power willingly. Even at ninety two. Even know. at ninety two. Yeah. I mean, apparently he has a new girlfriend and yeah. you know he must be on like getting bloody blood transfusions or I, something twenty four seven. I mean I, I can see that if you're thinking about the business yeah and you're ninety two, you might think that this is probably the, you know a, a smart move. But I can also imagine that after he's been on a nice holiday, yeah, he'll come back and think, "Hang on a minute, you know, I didn't say that was okay. I saved his life once, do you know? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's true. It is true. It's a bit Go of a bomb, bit of a bombshell. Maybe we it's should that, come that, back yeah, after. No, 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 tell, no, 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 tell me now. It was in Abu Dhabi at the Abu Dhabi Media Forum, something, yeah. right? And I went with Richard Wallace, who was the editor of the Mirror at the time. Oh, the two of us went. And we were having this great time in this marvellous... It was that same hotel where the Formula One track goes oh, underneath yes. it, right? So amazing venue. And the Murdochs are there. And Rupert, the day before, had given this speech where it became apparent he was he had the flu or something like that. And he just didn't look well. And he was rambling through this terrible speech right. about the sands of time will come to, you know, and all of this. And lost his place a couple of times. Oh, and, really? was, and just stopped. And like all totally powerful men, just stopped, you know, and thought, no problem, I'll just find my place. Yeah. But everyone else thought, my God, he's dying. Yeah, you know, and, and was, people were starting this to is it. get their cameras out, thought he's having a heart attack it's happening. or something like this. <laughs> anyway, he didn't. He got through the speech. And then the night after, there was a party at this rooftop terrace. And Richard was sat next to me and said, oh, I'm just going to go to the, to the loo. And uh, as Richard walked off to the loo, I see Murdoch walking straight past him. Richard doesn't clock him. And he's walking straight towards me. And I think, well, I might as well introduce myself to this Why you not? Know, titan. And as I stood up to greet Rupert Murdoch, there was, a, there was like a two-inch step on the decking and he tripped over and fell into my arms. And I caught him, right? And I caught Murdoch. He would have definitely clattered forward onto a coffee table with major repercussions for share prices across the world. But anyway, I caught him, propped him up, and he went, thanks very much, Sam. And I said, Rupert uh, Matt Kelly from the Daily Mirror said, nice to meet you, and then just trotted off past The me. ironies multiply. <laughs> he went off to be responsible for Brexit, without which we wouldn't be sitting uh, here. So in a way, that, yeah, it's a yeah. happy thing. 
It's a happy Christopher thing. Christopher Nolan would would re would put that right at the end of the movie, wouldn't he? Yes, that, that would be the, that would be the kind of where the, everything came clear. Everything, ah, that was that's the moment. why Brexit happened. That was the hinge of history. That's why the two mats <laughs> happened. That's why the New European is the fastest growing paper in in Europe. And, you know, and the UK is fucked as an economy. And why we are living that, in a bin fire of a nation. It was that two inch deck. If you step. hadn't been there yeah. with your Jedi reflexes, <laughs> imagine, right? Imagine. He would it was involuntary. Been, he'd now yeah, be yeah. in a coma, you know, yeah. or, or, uh, and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and we'd still be in the EU. Yeah, yeah. Happy yeah. thoughts, happy happy yeah. thoughts. Damn it. I missed it. I should have just, the, the hand, just done a quick side step. It's the hand I? of history, isn't it? It's the hand of history again. Uh, but it's oh. uh, an amazing story, and I think we'll be... Uh, yeah. I. I I'm sure we'll return to it, won't we? I'm sure we will. Well, that was a bit of a Spike Milligan about Hitler, wasn't it? My, my, I don't my, think my part, part in his my part in his survival. <laughs> um, thank you for that, uh, Matt. Fascinating, and uh, we'll come back after the break. We'll with, come back with, after the break with more media news. So, Matt, we're going to go on to another controversial media figure that um, has dominated the news this week, and that's Mr. Russell Brand. Yes, I mean, there was a, um, a lot of buzz um, on the Friday uh, after we recorded our last episode about this coming, the Dispatches uh, documentary and the, the Sunday Times Times investigation, lots of speculation about who it was, and it turned out to be Russell Brand. And, and it's been, you know, leading the news um pretty much ever since I mean, yeah. it's other and things. you wrote a great piece in the new european this week well thank you very much i mean i, I you know i the, the i mean the first thing to say is, this is the story is really about the women who had the courage to come forward and uh particularly the kind of proper old-fashioned really hardcore reporting of rosamund Irwin at the uh, sunny times and her team uh that led them to select four watertight cases that they knew that they could you know, if, if push came to shove, could get into court and win out of many, apparently, um, about Russell Brand. And it involves, as if, I think everyone knows by now, you know, allegations of rape and sexual mm. assault. He denies all these categorically, one has to say. But the... the Grim stuff, yeah. The reporters are very confident. Yeah. Um, and, and there's been... And the, the, it should be noted, there has been no suggestion that he's going to sue anybody for defamation. Not, not at all. Yeah. Um, Which would be my first instinct and someone accused you me of You would rape. have thought that, yeah. you know, yeah. that would be the first thing. Yeah. But, it, but it hasn't been. So, I mean, to... You know, my, my thoughts, first of all, was, you know, the incredible courage of the women coming forward and the brilliance of the reporting involved. And it's good... It's nice when journalism has a good day like and, that. And it's probably worth making a point, just a throwback to our discussion about Murdoch is that in a world where there aren't people like Murdoch who, despite all his faults, does invest in journalism, those these investigations can't happen. And Not at all. Ha- they won't happen. So I mean, it, had ha- it, yeah. it took them four years, yeah. this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's what people are sort of playing with when they say, oh, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. You can do this on the back of an envelope. No, you can't. No, you I mean, can't. if you want investigations of this caliber, it takes a long time and a lot of money. But my my other thought about uh, this was that I was really annoyed by the suggestion that there has been for a long time, actually, that people like Russell Brand are uh, rebels and outsiders and guerrillas, because as I think has now become very widely known, um, he has been uh, for some time a, a kind of keyboard warrior you know and a and a and a blo- and a, a vodcaster and he has drifted from the left to um not quite the alt right but a kind of conspiracy theorist mentality and one does one day he's got 28 million followers or something like that across all the platforms whether he was um and i wrote this in the piece he was kind of building a digital stockade around himself for this moment which he knew would come sooner or later because what's interesting is that the, res- the the defense of him and there have been a lot of people defending him you know, I had a horrible list of people you know uh andrew tate elon musk tucker carlson <laughs> uh, alex jones you know when you've got friends like that who, who who you know who needs enemies but also a lot of his followers saying this is the matrix this is the illuminati this is what do you expect with russell Gold was getting too close to the truth also weirdly loads of loads of women yes journalists 
that uh, you know Bev Turner, Alison Pearson. It's very surprising, isn't yeah, it? Really, really weird. You know that that's your instinct. To I go think out and I think what defending. it shows is that in fact we probably need a new term other than conspiracy theory because I think you know when we were growing up, conspiracy theories was kind of tinfoil hat. Roswell, Yeti's Loch Ness Monster. It was a kind of fringe activity and it was funny, you know. Yeah. And it, but conspiracy theories are now have now entered the mainstream. So as you say, you've got people who are not um you know sitting in a basement in somewhere in Oklahoma. Yeah. These are people on big media organizations who are to some extent, I mean in the Alison Pearson tweet, she referred to they with a capital T, yeah. which is a classic conspiracy yeah. theory trope um i don't know who they are neither does she but and way. neither does she yeah. and, and it's but it's as you say it's this, the suggestion it's the suggestion yeah. and i think that w- w- we have to in all of our political analysis now kind of price in the whole idea of um conspiracy theories as being mainstream not fringe mm. you know you look at trump you know the extent to which he is now ahead the polls this week say he's ahead of biden the guy who's facing 91 criminal charges every one of which is convincing his hardcore MAGA supporters that he's even better than they thought he was yeah and it, it's it's a really the dynamics of politics and media are now have changed so much and so you know to roll back a bit the meta looking into a 2003 allegation of rape in Soho again Brown denies this categorically so there is a real world where you know he is now on under there criminal is, investigation yeah, yeah. by the cops but yeah. but it is it is one needs to be permanently vigilant now because yeah. as you say the, there's a there's a it's surprising the kind of people who are running to his defense so, 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 not just suspending judgment yeah, but running yeah. to his defense some of the things that struck me weird uh, as weird about this story one um there's a lot of people trying to shut stuff down by saying, uh, you know, he's innocent until proven guilty. And, Which and is yes, true. In a, in, a court. Case, in a criminal case, that's absolutely true. Yeah. He is innocent. But that doesn't mean that a reasonable person shouldn't read uh, a dossier compiled by credible journalists done in credible news platforms uh, in incredible detail and come to the conclusion that he is a vile individual. And, uh, you yeah. know, that's absolutely reasonable. Well, I mean, uh, it's investigations like this that, um, in in the end, did for Boris Johnson. Because, you know, had it not been for Pippa Crara yeah. and ITV, um, Partygate would never have come right. to light. And, you know, uh, he was, in fact, uh, hand, as was Rishi Sunak, yeah. handed a, a penalty. But it's almost the- as though there's a source of th- uh, narrative developing, which is that, Nothing, nothing is is true until it's been proven true in a court of law, and, and that's, even that's then, bullshit. You know? And even then, can you imagine? I mean, uh, again, emphasising that he denies all charges, but let's say that he is charged, and let's say that he is convicted. We know that that the matrix will then be set by his supporters just to have absorbed the judicial system and the jury system and the jury was tampered with and there's a kind of readiness to uh, move the goalposts to shift the narrative endlessly to um acquit the person you're supporting yeah which is defies all rationality but this is the post-truth world we're living in yeah um and and i think um you know russell brand never been a fan of his um but it does it has made me think a lot about how some decades are radically more different from what follows than others. So yeah. the 90s and the noughties were not very different. But boy, the 2020s are different to the period we're talking about here, well, the this period is the of other, lad culture. Yeah. And well, I was going to say, I mean, we we describe it as lad culture and you have a sort of vision of your head of like, you know, page three girls and, um, you know, uh, loaded magazine and all of this business. But... When you look at what lad culture actually meant, yeah. it's some of it's horrific. Well, it you was know. Danny Dyer saying sometimes a, a woman needs a good slap. It, uh, it's the... uh, Chris Moyle saying, uh, I'd like to lead, what's her name, Charlotte uh, Church? Church. At the age of 16. Yes. I'd like to lead her through the forests of her sexuality or whatever yeah. it was. Right. On Radio 1, right? Yeah. It's Chris Evans, you know. Yes. Like, so, you know, there's something weird about that which, which wouldn't stand up to scrutiny today chris evans aged 35 or 36 
buying Billy Piper a Ferrari the day yes. after he met her and saying, I'm going to marry you. Her, she was aged 17 or 18. Which she did. And she did. Yeah. Now, you know, an FHM uh, uh, lording, um, you know, or, or the son rather, lording, lording uh, him as Shagger of the Year. Shagger of the Year, several this, times. Uh, there were still naked, uh, uh, topless women in, on the page three of the sun up until 10 years ago, basically, I think. And it was all, I remember, I mean, because the, the Dispatches program, I think, brilliantly interspliced some of his stand up material yeah, from oh that yeah oh my god era. that wasn't that the mascara stuff yes that and yeah, what you realise was that like Saville Jesus. he was basically saying yeah. exactly what he was alleged to have been doing in yeah. private and it was all I remember vividly because it's all sort of uh, defended under this veil of oh it's just irony now I love irony and life without irony is life unlived however I remember David Foster Wallace writing a brilliant essay about the tyranny of irony and how if you are just ironic mm. nothing means anything and yeah. there was a bit of that I think it's hollowed out you've hollowed it, yourself it out yeah. because I remember I mean one of the things that he he Russell Brand was un, indisputably guilty of was the horrible um episode I think it was in 2008 um where he had had an affair with um Andrew Sachs's granddaughter um, Georgina Bailey or that's right yeah, yeah. and um, he Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross guesting with him on his Radio yeah. 2 show left a series of horrific yeah. uh, uh, messages on Andrew Sachs's answer phone yeah. and indeed as we was reported widely this week Georgina Bailey, who who was kind of invisible in this whole thing, um, has suffered enormous mental health issues yeah. and so on. And she, but the, so the saddest thing about it is, she blamed herself. Yes, yeah, she blamed all herself. The way it. But I remember, by coincidence, uh, meeting Andrew Sachs about not long after the whole thing had happened. Russell Brand had been sacked. He'd gone off to Hollywood to make movies. Uh, the controller of Radio Two had been sacked, but only after a while, and. You know, the conversation turned naturally to what had just happened to him. And he was immensely sad about mm. what had happened. And He quote, didn't speak to his do- granddaughter for eight years for or something a, like that. a long time. And, and the saddest thing was, he said, I remember vividly, um, why did Russell Brand think he could get away with that? And that's, that was the question. And the question, of course, was because it was a time when he was being given a huge amount of rope by his uh, media handlers, by the BBC and Channel 4, uh, you know, and and other organisations. And I think the investigations into, the internal investigations of the BBC at Channel 4 will not make for pretty yeah. reading. Yeah. Because, you know, we know, for example, it's alleged that the 16-year-old uh, who's using the pseudonym Alice and was on Woman's Hour... Uh, with an actor's voice uh, was was allegedly taken to he was 31 when they were having an affair um, and was taken to his house or flat um, in a BBC car when she was 16 yeah I mean, it's extraordinary that was the that was the most touching thing I think about the whole thing was when the taxi driver turned to the girl yeah and said Love, don't, don't go in don't there. Don't go in there. Please, yeah. I've got a daughter your age. Don't do it. And, you know, he allegedly uh, sexually assaulted her quite seriously. Um, and, and it is very, very uh, hard to hear, read, watch mm. the, these allegations. But we need to because they remind you of how relatively recently the culture was radically different. But this, I think this is... Okay, so, I mean, there's a lot to be really... Um, uh, depressed about in this story yeah but also you can reflect how far we've come in in 10 15 years as a society yes. that this stuff is now just intolerable yeah i and, mean that... and i'd like to raise a point which um which i think should be raised for this because because one i think she's really brilliant i'm talking about marina Hyde, oh, the guardian yeah. columnist and, she, and i love it a bit so i think she's just a fantastic force in journalism but she wrote a piece this week about how much we've changed and how much uh, she felt personally guilty about the way she, that she had treated Georgina Bailey. And I went back and I, I found the column that she was referring to about her, and it's horrific. It's horrific. You know, I mean, not only was she unkind to Georgina Bailey, but she basically said, shut up and get over it, literally. Uh, and, and and called her all sorts of vile 
uh, names within that piece. And like I say, Marine is one of the most decent people well, that's I've come the, across. That's exactly what I was thinking well, that, when you were saying. This was, we're wrapped up in a culture. That's that, the problem you know, is that, yeah. you know, dec- in, in cultures that were like that, yeah. and maybe to some extent are more than we are ready to admit, um, still, a person as decent as Marina Hyde can write that. Yeah. And, you know, fair play to her for writing a piece, putting her hands up in the air. But it, do, it did illustrate. Absolutely. If I'm being honest, I think I would have been a bit more open about what I had written in the first place because she sort of glided around it in the piece. And a better piece would have been to say, this is what I said at the time and I can't believe I wrote yeah. it. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it, it, it is extraordinary. And it just illustrates the difference between, you know, uh, not a very long period of time, actually. Well, look, and also, you know, none of us should be sanctimonious about this because if you've been around in journalism as long as we both have, you've come across stories where you've made judgments that you look back on now 10 years, 20 years later. And and you think, Jesus Christ, what yeah. were we thinking of? No, absolutely. I mean, you know? it, uh, without without question. And, uh, you know, it, it it's doing a kind of self-audit forced by yeah. that sort of investigation is a very healthy practice i think it is and i think we should all think twice before throwing too many stones because if all it becomes is mudslinging as as it became between hadley freeman and owen jones where yes, there was no, a competition about then, who had sucked up to russell brand most or you know just what matters it, then it's just polarized nonsense the truth is that the only thing that matters really is that the women who've had the courage to come forward yeah. get the justice they deserve. And I hope they do. Yeah, I'd build on that. I don't think it's the only thing that matters. I think... Well, it's the main thing it's that the, matters. It's, that is, that is definitely one. the main Priority thing. Priority number one. But I think the ripple effect from that, that we all... Uh, that the world is just a bit more decent, without wanting to sound too kind of Disney, the world is just a little bit better yes. because we're all thinking about this shit. Is, yes. is also a good result. It forces, yeah, it forces reflection, and that's a good yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and you can see that, I mean, he, as we know, he did, he, Russell Brand, did a preemptive video yeah, the yeah, night before yeah. uh, on his YouTube channel, um, denying everything preemptively without specifying what he was denying. And you could see from his manner that he was fairly confident or at least acting as if he was fairly confident that he's going to get away with it and mm. I don't think he is actually um, I, that's my one, one, bet on this I've got a slightly different take on your theory about him consciously building the yep. stockade as you called it I don't think he's that smart I, th- <laughs> I just think that he's an enormous narcissist and he'd run out of mainstream yes, platforms that's true. and he graduated to the only platform he could find which yes. was social media and he and he thrives on narcissism and so it was almost inevitable he would he would find somewhere to I mean get let's this put out. it this way I'm sure he intuited that once you've got the uh, attention of conspiracy theorists they're a lot more loyal yeah. than the more capricious conventional yeah. uh, you know fandom that he cultivated in the noughties and the tens you yeah. know um well we shall we shall see but we i mean it, it, this is a this is one to watch it really is definitely big big story okay so what didn't we have time to talk about this week matt well i'd like to um give a, a shout out to a movie um whose premiere i was very lucky to attend last night which is the great escaper uh which is a, a three-hander with um sir michael kane the late glenda jackson sadly died in june age 87 and John Standing, and it tells a true story of a guy called Bernie Jordan, who in 2014 basically did a runner from his care home in Hove and made his way solo to Normandy for the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And it's just a terrific movie, and it's kind of... um, deeply emotional without being in the slightest bit sentimental fantastic which is a terrific movie. have you ever seen the straight story by yes uh, directed by david lynch about an old guy who gets on his lawnmower to terrific, go and see his brother terrific yeah. movie no uh, it's, i think it's out on october the 6th and i can't recommend fantastic, it highly enough fantastic i'd like to mention um i live in highbury in arsenal and i found myself bizarrely starstruck because <laughs> And I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm pretty good around famous people, and in, I work on the basis that they've got to be somewhere, right? And it just happens. Yes, they can't there, be. They know, don't so live in the ether. They're do all they? there. Yeah. So anyway, but I was sort of passing where Burberry were having their fashion show on Highbury Fields, and there was this congregation of kids all screaming, and the paparazzi and brrr, lights going off, 
And so curiosity overtook me and I came by and I stood and I watched lots of Koreans and Japanese fashion influencers, I assume, and K-pop stars and all of this. But then Kano arrived. Oh, my lordy. Otherwise known as Sully from Top Boy. Yes. Looking absolutely resplendent in a sort of camouflage tracksuit. And Kano did his thing on the sort of walkway in. And I just found myself in, you know, I had no idea how much I thought of him. Uh, but a brilliant star. At uh, your recommendation, yeah. I have started watching it. And, have you? Yeah. And spot on. It's great. It's yeah. tremendous. People are going to think this is sponsored by Netflix, but it's not. But it is. It, Top well, Boy we're is very a- happy to be sponsored by Netflix. <laughs> if you're out there, Netflix, we are. Or, you know, or Burberry. Or Burberry. <laughs> or anyone, really. Um, yeah. But should we also quickly talk about Keir Starmer? Yes. The EU. Because um, interesting week. I mean, we talked a lot on the podcast about Keir Starmer and the EU. But um, he seems to have... uh, I I, I don't think it's a a, a policy change, but there's a little more confidence in his approach to all this, which is he was in Ottawa, I think, or no, Montreal. Mm. And he gave an, an interview to the FT in which he said that when our trade and cooperation agreement with the EU comes up for uh, renewal in 2025-26, he's going to, you know, really try and make it more uh, more of a proper partnership with the yeah. EU. And just something in the language made me very cautiously optimistic. Yeah. However, mm. and I know you, what you're going to say. Is, <laughs> well, you say. Well, go, no, uh, then France and Germany suggest a, a new system of... Me- tiered suggestion of membership tiered system of membership of the eu including uh, associate membership which is clearly designed to be for the uh, uk yeah and labor ran a mile to say no chance yeah yeah and so the thing that that pisses me off about keir starmer's approach to all of this is i honestly don't know what he believes and i'm honestly beginning i don't want to sound like i hate every politician i don't and i certainly don't hate keir starmer but I do think he has got a, a transparency issue where I don't think he is prepared to tell people what they don't want to hear. And I think he also has a track record for pledging things and making announcements and then dropping them when it becomes inconvenient. You know, you know the two-child cap on benefits, he pledged that he would drop that and then he's reversed that. Uh, tuition fees, he's backed out on that. Uh, £28 billion pounds a year on climate change backed out on that uh, taxing the top five percent more backed out on that um so and, and nationalization as well or what they called common ownership kind of bit of loyally language he introduced around that and when it comes to brexit i think this thing he said to the ft about wanting to renegotiate the deal well you know he's got to get it takes two to tango and i'm not sure there's any appetite at the european union for a serious material renegotiation. They see this point as a refi- and about finessing stuff, not as let's rip it up and start again. So I also believe that uh, until the European Union are confident that both main parties in the UK have got a clear view on what our relationship with Europe should be, they're not really that interested no, in our psychodrama anymore. So for the listeners of the two mats, I thought, uh, you know, public service i just call someone who i knew knows Keir very well okay. yesterday wednesday is it Keir? Um, <laughs> i'm not prepared to disclose my sources oh my God. um and i said what, what's going on and i've got my notes here which is um so i said you know because on the back of gina miller's excellent cover piece in the new european yeah. this week i thought well, come on then I, I said what what is what is his policy on rejoining Keir does not expect the UK to rejoin the EU during his time as Prime Minister. Okay? Okay. Number one. So I thought, okay, that's a bit wiggle room. So I said, does he expect to apply for membership? Answer, he does not expect that to happen on his watch either. Right? Right. So fine. my final try, what about rejoining the single market? Quote, you are aware of Labour's policy on that, which is not... Which is it not, never, not in the... But... Government. That was the only right. bit of non-denial denial, yeah, right? Yeah. So I that I just leave that on the table for people okay. to consider. Well, I think I think we are caught in, as ever, caught in a, you know a gulf between actuality and what is being said, and that is largely to keep people on side. And I get that he's talking to two constituencies and he and he needs their votes, but at least one of those constituencies is going to be deeply pissed off 
become a Labour government. So thanks for listening, folks. We will be rolling out, this is big news, a second weekly question and answer episode in a couple of weeks. So get your questions in, please. And thank you, by the way, to all those who have already emailed. But get your questions in to 2 mats. that's the number 2, M-A-T-T-S, at T-N-E publishing dot co dot uk two mats at tne publishing dot co dot uk tne like the new european listeners to the two mats podcast can become subscribers to the new european and why wouldn't you want to and get a free copy of rory stewart's brand new book politics on the edge which is the number one bestseller it is so you can get that for free what a bargain what a bargain and the new european from just a pound a week my God. Another bargain. Honestly. Head to the neweuropean.co.uk forward slash two mats. And there's a link in the show notes. And you can get all of the digital New European for a pound a week. Or if you want the newspaper delivered to your door every single week, what joy. That's just another pound a week as well. Thank you as ever to the third Matt, producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. And until next week. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye.